For the very latest in the fight against the coronavirus, Dr. Ann Liu joins us now from Stanford Healthcare. Thanks so much for being here today. We got to start off by talking about the latest sub-variant that is causing some concern. What are your thoughts? So the one that people have heard the most about is the BA.2 uh, subvariant of the Omicron. Um, it is really causing some surges in uh, Asia and also in some European countries. Um, it has definitely been in the US and has been circulating in the US. It is pretty closely related to the original Omicron. Uh, and it's it seems to be similar or maybe a little bit more transmissible than BA.1. It's increasing as a proportion of the cases that are being picked up these days. Um, there's not really any evidence to suggest that it causes any more severe disease though. It may similarly reduce the effectiveness of vaccines and therapies uh, just as Omicron did. Uh, boosting seems to uh, still produce this, a similar level of protection by boosting the neutralizing antibodies. Um, and uh, uh, having had Omicron before probably protects, for, provides some protection against BA.2, we are hoping. And, uh, and so the hope is that because of the very large Omicron wave that we had already, that hopefully when it, it uh, spreads more in the US, that the landing will be hopefully a bit softer. And, uh, and I think that we do expect that there will be an increase in cases. It will be an uptick, especially since you know, there are so many, uh, um, uh, so many places that have stopped um, masking mandates in schools and in businesses. Uh, and so there will be an increase in cases, whether that leads to a surge or to uh, increased hospitalizations is yet to see, but we have yet to see, but, you know, we really do want to keep an eye on the uh, folks in our population who are at risk, meaning those who are elderly, even if they are vaccinated, and those who are immunocompromised. Yeah. So do you have concerns when you see all of this people walking around without masks, the schools unmasking, everybody sort of acting like it's 2019? Yeah, you know, it's tough. I think that our level of concern should uh, be um, uh, should be flexible according to the, the current conditions at the very moment. Uh, cases in our area are fairly low, but uh, but I think that people should be prepared to uh, reinstitute some of those protections, including masking that we had before. Something to also keep in mind is that as mask mandates have been dropped in schools, there's still a lot of kids who are unvaccinated, uh, those under five, and many kids who are of school age and eligible for vaccination remain unvaccinated. So there will be an increase in cases. So if you are out there and still wondering about vaccination, it is still a good idea to do it. This is the right time to do it because it'll give you a few weeks before you get that full protection. And we're expecting that cases will start to go up uh, over that period of time. Now, what about the parents of kids who could be hit very hard by the coronavirus? Somebody who say has lung problems, but they're four years old, too young to get a vaccine, you know, should they be going into the grocery store with their parents, things like this? I think that we would want, we would encourage the same kinds of precautions that people were taking during the surge for those who are at a higher risk and unvaccinated or at higher risk and unlikely to produce a response to the vaccine, including having really good masks, KN95s, KN94s, N95s, uh, particularly in situations where a lot of other people are unmasked and, uh, um, and taking care to do socializing outdoors, which is gonna be you know, much easier now that the weather is getting warmer and we've had daylight savings. So uh, I would keep in mind some of those, those uh, now common sense practices and um, keep in mind that there is probably more to come. Hopefully it won't be terrible, but there's probably still more to come. All right, we talked about the subvariant BA2. What about this hybrid variant we're hearing about with Delta Cron? Is that what we're calling it? So I, I know I've heard in the press it, it has been called Delta Cron. So when there are multiple circulating variants at the same time in the population, then, uh, then some individuals will get two different variants at the same time. And that gives an opportunity for a virus that's replicating within the same person to exchange uh, genetic information. And so what results is 
these sort of mashup viruses where you have uh, um, some genetic material from Delta virus, some from BA.1 or the original Omicron. And there have also, and there are multiple strains of that that have been identified uh, and they're all a little different. And there have also been strains that have been identified that are a mashup of BA.1 and BA.2. So uh, that's not surprising. You know, we know that there's going to be more variants. We don't know yet that uh, they will behave any worse than what we are seeing with Omicron and Delta. Uh, that is to be determined so far. There's not evidence of that yet, but I think that we should keep in mind that there's always the possibility of another variant around the corner and that's gonna be more transmissible or more severe than what we've already seen. Okay, yeah, a lot of unknowns there. We know uh, Pfizer is looking for emergency use authorization of a fourth booster shot for people 65 and older. Is this something that we could see coming down the pike for all of us, the fourth shot? So the, the data supporting a fourth dose is more in people who are at higher risk, those who are elderly, uh, certainly those who are immunocompromised. And uh, there is some data to suggest that it may improve uh, um, protection against getting an infection. It may not have much of an additional benefit though against protecting against severe disease or hospitalization. There's not really any data yet that suggests that it is of significant benefit in people who are younger with fewer risk factors though. So uh, I'm going to be curious to see what that data shows. Uh, I've heard that um, we're seeing also that Moderna may also seek a fourth dose for all ages. So more to follow on that. Uh, for those who are immunocompromised, certainly the recommendation already is to get a fourth dose booster. So um, uh, to bolster any bit of protection that somebody who's immunocompromised might get, uh, keeping in mind that there are some people who are immune compromised who don't uh, benefit very much from the vaccine. So we should still uh, keep those folks in mind. Okay, now when it comes to the shots, we have the mRNAs, the Pfizer, the Moderna, and then there was the Johnson & Johnson. Early on, there was some concern about the efficacy of the J&J &J shots, but that's turning around now. Where are we at with that? Yeah, you know, J&J &J really got uh, left out in the cold last year. Uh, I think that with the the information about the rare but non-zero blood clots in young women, and also because of the higher antibody levels uh, from mRNA vaccines compared to J&J &J vaccines, uh, to the J&J &J vaccine, the J&J &J vaccine really, um, I think, got the cold shoulder. But um, even back then, we knew that a single dose of a J&J &J vaccine produced a really durable antibody response and also really robust responses from another type of immune cell called T cells, which are a lot harder to measure than antibody levels. And so much has been hung on antibody levels as being the marker of whether somebody is protected. But this just shows us that the immune system is a lot more complex than just antibody levels. So uh, the the J and J vaccine with uh, two doses, uh, based on um, uh, research from South Africa, offered a really similar level of protection compared to the mRNA vaccine given three times against Omicron hospitalizations and severe illness. And that shows us that it's not just about antibodies and that in the face of Omicron, J&J &J probably still has a really valuable role. It also can, is easier to store and administer uh, the number of shots and the temperature it's for that. And so I think that it still has a really significant role um, uh, not only in the US, but also in other countries where, um, where freezers are in less, uh, um, in lower supply. Um, the, I think it's gonna be the dark horse. There are other vaccines also under evaluation. I've seen a lot of patients who, for whatever reason, have had difficulty tolerating the mRNA vaccines. And, uh, and for those folks, I think that J&J &J and um, possibly some of the other vaccines that are coming may be good options. Okay. Dr. Ann Liu with Stanford Healthcare. A lot of good advice there and information. We know it's ever-changing. Thanks for your perspective. My pleasure.